And I'm recording now. Okay, so at any rate, one of the disadvantages of, of this today is, is that I'm using the microphone on my laptop. So the sound's not going to be quite as good, and I'm glued to my laptop. So I'm going to glance up every once in a while to talk to you guys, see if there's problems or something like that. If you have questions, uh, hopefully by the next session I'll be set up with a wireless mic so I can, I'm not planted right here at this desk all the way down here. Unfortunately, that thing weighs 8,000 pounds, and I think they got bolted, bolted to the floor, so I can't use it as a lectern in this room. And it's connected by wires that are like three feet long. So uh, uh, so I would use that if, the, if it's possible, right? So let's let's get started, and we'll talk about what the next part of a, uh, what we're doing is. I just want to back up a second just to uh, reiterate that um, um, uh, in this presentation, we already covered outside for people that maybe weren't here today or something like that. If you look back, what our expectations for you are, what your expectations might be for me, um, uh, uh, what we're going to do today anyway. Uh, we reviewed the, uh, 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 the class issue, which again, I'll, location wise, we'll work that out. The issues with SPSS, we're going we're gonna to be using SPSS, Excel, uh, probably Microsoft Word as well. Uh, probably have access to most of that except SPSS which you have options, which are on the syllabus. Uh, again, SPSS, for the, work, for the sake of the recording, uh, you want the uh, student version, minimum student version, six-month license uh, for the SPSS grad pack base version. If you want to be a little bit more ambitious, you might go for the, for the SPSS grad pack standard version, which includes logistic regression, which will just be covered in lecture here in this particular class, but you may be interested in anyway. It's a few more dollars. And when you download it from either the IBM website, you can Google you know, SPSS student versions. When you download it from the IBM website or on the hub.com or uh, other places, there's some links, I think, on uh, uh, the ICID website from uh, Hunter. Uh, when you download it from there, make sure you download the version for your particular computer. If it's a Mac or if it's a Windows computer. Um, uh, so we want to make sure you're familiar with the syllabus. There's an area on Blackboard board called Course Materials. It's going to have links for where you can go to uh, uh, figure out how to get your city program certificate in uh, uh, human ethics, uh, re, uh, ethics in human research. Um, uh, and some other course material information. Okay, so syllabus, again, the book. Uh, in the syllabus, we have the book, which is open source. You can download it as a PDF file, or you can get printed versions of it from a series of sources. Again, that information is on Blackboard. Okay, so what is statistics? Well, statistics have been around, you know, statistics in one form or another have been around for a long time, right? I mean, basically, statistics is just a way for us to understand data. Right. So how do you how do you accumulate data, how you gather it, how you understand what that data means? So you need statistics. One of the first things you're going to want to do with statistics is you're going to want, going to want to start to understand how to collect data. Right. And you want to collect it in a manner that's going to be useful to you later on. So that's one of the things we want to learn when we learn about statistics. Every year, students contact me. Two years later, they come back and they contact me and says, Tony, I have this database that I've been I've been collecting data with this survey for the last six months. I'm ready to analyze the data. Can you help me out with this? Well, problem is, is that you've been collecting the data for the last six months. And you already structured the data. You already structured your questions, your survey, and stuff like that. So we're stuck trying to work with the data that you did, trying to fit it into some statistical parameters. Much better if you figure out how am I going to analyze the data before you do the survey, right? So you know that you're asking the people what you need to know. You know, you're not going to go back. You're not going to have to go back and get more information, that the information that you're going to get is useful, that it's in a format that's going to be useful to you, and so on. So the time to figure out what kind of statistical analysis you're going to do, how much data you need to collect, uh, 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 how you're going to perform a survey, and so on and so forth, is before you do the work before you do the survey and collect the data. Okay, so one of the things we're going to do is we're going to want to figure out a way to describe the data that we've collected. One way to describe it is to just get display a list of numbers. They're not very efficient because you see a lot of numbers on a screen or something like that. You're really not going to be able to interpret it or figure out what it means very easily. 
maybe we could kill the light back there, makes it a little easier to see that screen. Is that a possibility? Okay, no snoring. Don't take, don't take that as an excuse to fall asleep. Okay, so at any rate, um, and once we've described, we need a way to describe the data. Very frequently from a statistical point of view, how would you describe data? For instance, if I'm, if I'm interested in the blood pressure of uh, people that eat a lot of pizza, right? How would you describe, you, go, you collect uh, 100 blood pressure readings from 100 people that eat, that really enjoy pizza. How would you describe that information? Yeah. Well, uh, just in terms of what's the data mean? I mean, you know, what is their blood pressure? You got 100 numbers. What's the blood pressure of people that eat, that like pizza? Right. Well, one thing you might look at is the range. What's the lowest number? What's the highest number? Right. What's another thing you might look at? The average. the average. Where's the middle? You know, middle is kind of like half the people are below and above. There's a couple of ways you can describe that, right? We're going to talk about that median and mean and so on and so forth. But you're getting ahead of me, right? Because now you're getting to the point where you want to apply that information. That's the inferential part of statistics. So we need to have a way, a mechanism to describe large masses of data. Nowadays, they have this stuff with like giant databases and genetic research where you have enormous amounts of data and so on and so forth. They call that big data, right? Hopefully, we won't get involved with too much big data because it's a kind of a special area. So we're going to work mostly with smaller data sets. So at any rate, so you want a way to describe that. One of the ways is the range. One of the ways is is the me the middle, whether it's a median or mean. You know that's that's pretty intuitive. The other thing we were interested in is how variable is it. In other words, the range tells us a certain amount about the variability, the so lowest and the highest. It doesn't tell us too much about everybody else. So we need some sort of mechanism to tell us is this like. Uh, are those people I just rare, those the highest and the lowest, or are most of the people around them very close to the mean, or are they spread out uh, very far from the mean for the most part? So we're interested in how do we describe it. Then we're interested in how we're going to apply that information, what that tells us about people that eat pizza. That's our inference part of this whole thing. Um, you can look, go through this timeline when you get a chance, read it. It's kind of interesting. It's got a lot of pictures on it and stuff like that. That's always good. And and uh, uh, but you can see that this idea of uh, measuring things, accumulating data, trying to understand the data goes back a long way. Modern statistics, a lot newer, right? Because we know epidemiology is a relatively new science, right? So statistics, which goes along with public health and epidemiology, is a more modern science than, than a lot of other things. OK, so a couple of definitions. One of the primary things that we're going to differentiate between is the idea of a population and a sample, right? So a population is everybody within a particular group that you describe. What I just described is everybody in the United States between the ages of 40 and 60 that likes pizza, right? That's a population. That's everybody. A sample is a selection from that population, maybe 100 people maybe randomly selected in one form or another, 100 people. That's a sample from that population. That population has a mean. Like, for instance, the population of the people I just described has an average blood pressure, right? For the most part, we're never going to know what that is. That's really what we want to know. We're not interested in the average blood pressure of 100 people. We're interested in the average blood pressure for the entire population. Problem is, is that we don't have the resources to test the blood pressure of everybody in the population. So we're going to be satisfied with taking a sample from that population, finding out what the average of that population is, and inferring from that that it, that would be probably pretty close to what the population average is. How often are we going to know what the real population average is? Virtually never. Right. So we're always going to be almost always going to be working with samples and from that trying to infer what the population uh, 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 averages. What do you think a couple of factors might be in getting a good handle on what the population uh, average might be? What would improve your guess using a sample? Ran uh, well, randomizing it. So, you know, you're not, you're not just picking people in New York. 
that eat a lot of pizza, where other parts of the country they eat something that looks like pizza but is not really pizza, for instance. Or, or, or yeah, you got ahead of me. Dude, both of you got ahead of me again, right? So, so uh, 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 yeah. And and what would make it a better estimate, right? Besides randomizing, what would make it a better estimate? How, should I pick ten people, or should I pick a hundred or a thousand? Sample size. Because the sample size is going to be the more, the uh, the more uh, 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 the better that I can the the more reliability my estimate for the population sample is, right? So sample size is going to impact us quite a bit. But it's important to distinguish between population numbers and sample numbers. In fact, we're going to use different notation wrong. When we talk about population mean and spread, we're going to use, when we say mean, we're going to use the Greek letter mu to represent the mean of the population. But we're going to use X bar for the average of the uh, sample. Right, so we distinguish right away that, and just by looking at it, I say x bar is equal to 100. You know that's a sample mean. Or if I say mu is equal to 120, that's a population mean that represents population. We're going to work with other uh, statistics as well. It's that standard deviation, a whole bunch of other nasty things, right? So, but uh, we deal. Uh, you just mentioned what's the one place that we actually deal with a population where you have a, a handle of a whole population. Yeah, well, once every 10 years, we do a census, right? Now, let me ask you something. Uh, in New York City, we have a lot of um, um, non-English speaking immigrants. You have a lot of non-documented people and so on and so forth. So when the census is taken in New York City, right, what happens to those people? They're undercounted, right? And we know they're undercounted because... In addition to doing the regular, uh, the regular uh, uh, census where they fill out the forms and so on and so forth, they actually send people out in the neighborhoods and aggressively look for people like that so they can see how much we're undercounted and stuff like that. Okay. Now, wouldn't it make sense that if we know that we're undercounting the population of this neighborhood by 10% to adjust that in the census? Right? In other words, they can take account. Raise it by ten percent. Why don't we do that? Because it's not it's not accurate. We can't be certain of it. You can't be certain of it, but there's another reason. The census that the census is required in the in the Constitution, and it has to be a physical count. It has to be a an, uh, you can't adjust it statistically, right? So in order to do it more rationally like making an adjustment for errors that we know that are inherent errors that are built into it, they would have to pass a constitutional amendment. How likely is that? What's the last time we passed a constitutional amendment? Anybody know? Been a while, right? It's been at least, I don't know, about 30 years or something like that, maybe longer. I can't remember the last one. What was the last one that almost passed? It fell one state short. Right? Equal rights amendment for women. That was, I think that fell one or two states short. They had to have three quarters of the states ratifying. I think it was like one or two states short. And then it ran out of time. Okay, so at any rate, it's in the Constitution how it has to be done. And it doesn't allow for any statistical correction of it uh, if, if there's a known undercounting or something like that. Okay, that's the last time I'll bring up uh, anything regarding politics in this class. I hope. I'll try. Okay, so, okay. so here we go. Um, um, uh, so you have a population. You also may have subpopulations within that. Notice I said uh, people 40 to 60 years old and so on and so forth, qualifying that and so on. Okay. Uh, entire group, again, is a census. Okay. So now descriptive statistics. This page is the cover of a document that you can actually find in, on the New York City NYC.gov website, Department of Health website. It is the cover for the annual publication of the uh, 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 vital statistics for New York City. What does vital statistics mean? Vital means like life, right? Life and death and stuff like that. It actually has all the statistics on how many people were born, how many people were, how many people died, what diseases they died of, and so on. It's all summarized in, uh, not just summarized, but it's actually tabulated. They actually have the actual numbers that they've counted 
uh, uh, and it's also the it's organized in all sorts of different ways by age, by gender, uh, by disease, by uh, uh, so on and so forth. This particular chart that we see behind us is the mortality rate, right? The the uh, 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 and uh, you can see the rate at which people were dying in New York City over this long period of time that they've been maintaining records. I notice that you'll see spikes in here when there have been significant disease outbreaks. And what's been going on here now with the uh, 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 vital statistics? The mortality rate has been diminishing over time. You have fewer and fewer of these spikes where we have a lot of uh, 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 problems with uh, a, a particular incident, disease, pandemic, or something like that that uh, 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 comes along and impacts the mortality rate in New York City significantly. What was the last thing that gave us a spike in the mortality rate in New York City? Can you guys read it there? Yeah, 1918, right? The influenza pandemic. We were just talking about that with a couple of students here. We're just about getting somebody here we were concerned about using the uh, keyboards. And be honest with you, now that they did that, I'm a little concerned about using the keyboards here because I probably never clean them. Right? I just it hadn't occurred to me. And we were talking, and I was mentioning that right around this time every year, there's kind of a little bit of concern about whether there's some new strain of influenza that's developing in the Far East and, and so on and so forth that might become pandemic and so on and so forth or from some other area. And uh, uh, you start to see a lot of companies, a lot of healthcare facilities have planning sessions for pandemics in case they occur, influenza pandemics most, uh, uh, most of the time. Um, and every year I see all sorts of interesting stuff about how they plan it, what they're concerned about. And I was just telling uh, the couple of people that were here early, I was just telling them that uh, I, I, I remember somebody gave me a list from one of these sessions of all these like little details that, gee, you might want to consider this and so on and so forth. And one, some of them are border on paranoid. One of them was that when you get on an elevator, right, never touch the lobby button with your hand, right? Yeah, hit it with your elbow or something like that. Well, why, why is the lobby button special? Everybody, Everybody in the building touches the lobby button, right? If you're in a 40-story building, only five a few percent of the people touch that each individual floor, everybody in the building touches that lobby button, right? So if you're in a pandemic and a lot, there's a lot of influenza going around, you know, you know, some lobby, you know. So that stuff happens, right? So you want, yeah, and you're concerned about doorknobs and bathrooms and so on and so forth. And we we're just talking that, like, that, uh, you know, uh, what about the, if you notice that the bathroom, there's a couple of bathrooms over there and there's a, uh, a hand sanitizer uh, outside of the bathroom. Anybody try and use that today? Yeah, what happened? Empty. It's empty. It's been empty for like a year, I think. Right? Well, it's been certainly been empty since since January, right? That I know of. Right? So not filling. Hopefully as we get into flu season and stuff like that, they'll wake up to start filling them again. Right. So we had a relatively mild flu season this past year. So I didn't I don't think they paid that much of attention that much of attention to it. Okay. So we want to make inferences from the information that we get from all of this uh, uh uh, all of these statistics, how we describe them, and so on and so forth. Uh, we wanted to be able to describe the statistics. We want to be able to make comparisons. What if I do this intervention? Do things get better or do they get worse? Okay. Uh, let's see. Statistic of it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we have, we're also going to work. We're also going to be talking about different kinds of studies. Anybody here take epidemiology yet? Okay. That's going to be the next, right? So when it, that's unusual because usually – just kind of a prerequisite for that, right? Did you take it somewhere else? Is that it? Are you taking it simultaneously? Oh, okay. Or they let you they let you jump jump ahead a little bit and take. But for most of you guys, you're probably taking this as a prerequisite for epidemiology because in epidemiology you're going to be looking at a lot of this stuff. One of the things that they're going to be discussing in epidemiology that we're going to cover a little bit here is different study types. For instance, this, uh, well, certain kinds of studies are called experimental studies, where you have two groups. One you give a, dr a drug to, one you give a placebo to. You want to analyze the result of that. You're going to use the statistics to determine whether the difference in, say, blood pressure for group A is 
uh, whether group, the blood pressure in group A is different from the blood pressure in group B, which might be a placebo or something like that. The only problem is, is that if the two groups had exactly the same thing, would they have exactly the same blood pressure? Took 20, if you take 20 people, no difference between them, split them up into two groups of 10, right, just randomly, and you took their blood pressure, would you wind up with an average of two groups the same? No, there's like zero, almost zero chance of that, right? There's going to be some difference, right? Well, is that di that difference in that case, if you did a good job randomizing, that difference is just due to chance. It just happens that this group had a few more people with higher blood pressure than the other group. Now, when you look at a difference in a drug study, there's always going to be a difference, right? New blood pressure is never going to be the same. Is that difference due to chance or is that difference so great that you could say that that difference is real. It's a difference in the population, not just in the people that you've sampled. That's a big part of what we're going to be doing about study design, how you design studies, how you collect data, and so on and so forth. Okay, and well, we'll get into this. Okay, one of the first things we're going to learn about is, is that different kinds of data wind up being analyzed in different ways. Okay, so we have to understand what kind of data that we have. So I got four. And when you use SPSS, SPSS breaks the data up into three data types, right? It breaks it up into nominal. Also, sometimes they call that categorical, right? Basically, that's just names or categories, right? Um, uh, it breaks it up into numerical data. And numerical data is stuff like blood pressure, something that's on a continuous scale, that, you know, you can have different, you know, like that, that, rep, that something represents a number that's real and makes a difference. So in other words, if a blood pressure is, somebody has blood pressure of 90, uh, milli, what is it, milli, 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 millimeters, no, it's 90 millimeters of mercury, right, versus someone else that has 100 millimeters of mercury, you know that that's a difference of 10 millimeters of mercury. It's a real scale. And you know that the difference between 100 and 110 is the same quantity as the difference between 90 and 100, right? That's a numerical scale or scalar variable. SPSS likes to call it rather than numerical, calls it scalar. It's data that's on scale. Okay, so we have nominal or categorical data, which is just names. In other words, gender. Is just a name, right? Male or female. A uh, hair color is, you know, brunette, blonde, redhead, uh, uh, green, blue, right? Whatever, whatever hair color you might have, that's a name. It's a category, right? It doesn't have a a number value. It's not a scale. Um, um, and then there's a third kind of data which kind of crosses over a little bit. That's data that's basically categorical, but the categories have some relation to each other. For instance, a uh, good if, if I told if I asked you um, uh, what's your impression of this course so far, considering the fact we didn't even have room room when we started, you graded on a poor, fair, good, e excellent, right? Say four things. Those are things. Those are categories. However, those categories are relative have relative value one to the other. Uh, uh, fair is better than poor. Good is better than fair. And, uh, and excellent is better than all, all of them. But you don't know how big a difference between, the difference between fair and good is in your mind. It may not be the same as the difference between good and excellent, right? In other words, there's no way to quantify whether or not that scale is an even scale. Somebody give me an example of a scale that you people that are in uh, 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 nursing or emergency room services or EMS or something like that, a scale that you might use that's an ordinal scale. It's got, an, uh, it's got categories, but the, those categories have relative value. One's more than the other, but you can't tell really whether one compares to some, when somebody tells you that they're in this category, that it's the same as somebody telling you they're in the same category, that they really have the same thing. Pain scale. pain scale, right? Zero to ten, right? Tell how much pain are you in? Zero to ten. Yeah. Your seven might have nothing to do with somebody else's seven. Okay, for the most part, my wife's my wife's three is my eight, right? That, this is the way it is. This is the way it is with women. Women have my my wife had a uh, she had knee replacement. She had she had a problem with arthritis. She had double knee replacement. She had them both done at the same time. The nurses. At uh, uh, Hospital for Joint Diseases had a special name for that procedure. They called it the double whammy. 
Right. So at any rate, now she got through that. I would have been inconsolable through the whole time, you know? So, so, but yeah, I had no idea. They put her in this thing, made her move her legs like right after the surgery. And, and, uh, and, uh, uh, the only time she really complained about the pain was she had an epidural and uh, immediately after surgery for a day, she had an epidural. But then they give you a uh, one of these drips. Yeah, what it, it, right. CPAP, is that what it is? No, or PCA. PCA pump. Right. So they gave her one of those. And, and the epidural was wearing off and she hadn't been keeping up. She wasn't in any pain. So she wasn't using, she didn't start using it until she really started to feel some pain. So it took a while for her to catch up. So uh, that was the only time that that was really bad. The rest of the time, she really didn't complain at all. Me, I forget it. I would have been complaining constantly. So her eight, her three is my eight, right? And the other thing is, is that if I tell you uh, the level of pain I'm in now is seven, and then you give me a couple of Tylenol, you come back, what's the level now? I say five. You don't know whether the difference between seven and five for me is the same as the difference between five and three. Right. So that's called ordinal data. It has it's categorical, but it has some order to it. But it's not scalar. You can't depend on those numbers to be uh, 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 the same as a number scale like numerical data. So we have nominal data. We have ordinal data and we have continuous scalar. You're going to see here this by a, a number of different names. I also included it in here because the textbook probably has a discrete data. Usually discrete data refers to integer, kind of like how many siblings do you have? And you have three siblings, right? So so how many uh, 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 how many wives do you have? One, right? So so that's typically what you would call discrete data. How many cups of coffee did you drink today? Six, right? How many cups of coffee did you uh, 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 do you drink on average every week? Oh, that uh, turns out to be 7.3. One of those is discrete data. The other one, the 7.3, is an average that, you know, there's a continuous scale. That's really, you know, continuous data, right? It, it's not going to be integers all the time, right? So you can look, but really discrete data is kind of the same kind of data as continuous data. So SPSS doesn't even distinguish between them, right? Three categories, uh, scalar or num numerical, um, uh, a nominal or categorical, and uh, 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 and ordinal. Okay, we're not going to be working too much with ordinal data. Maybe it'll come up a little bit, but I, not a lot of the, the examples that we work with comes up with it. Yeah, there's a, I could have been fast forwarding through this stuff. Performance scale. Okay, okay, ordinal data. Okay, they they're they're uh, well, that's numerical. This what we're looking at there is numerical data. Oh, well, this is re what's the relative, well, wh what are the le leading causes of death, right? Well, heart disease, number one, cancer, number two, and so on and so forth. The number itself is, is numerical data, but the order that they're in is ordinal data. Okay, and you have some other examples here as well. Okay, continuous data, right? Okay, so we're going to be learning how to summarize this data. That's going to be important to us. So let's take a look at this kind of stuff that winds up in categories like nominal and ordinal data. If I, if I have 100 people and I am going to uh, – uh, I'm, uh, I'm going to look at one piece of data about those that 100 people, their gender, right? Well, what statistic will I use? What, 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 how will I organize the data where gender is concerned? Well, the only thing I can really do with gender is count them. How many males are there? How many females are there? And basically, that's what you do. You do a frequency table. How many of each are there? Uh, we have 100 people. How many of them have a BMI less than this, have a BMI between these two numbers, and a BMI greater than those two numbers? Three categories. How would we, how would we deal with that? We don't know what the actual number is. We only know that they're in those categories. So we would summarize that with a frequency table. I'm going to run to about what time is it now? 247. I'm going to run to about 315, then I'm going to let you guys bail out, right? So, and then I'm going to put some stuff on Blackboard that we can, uh, that maybe, maybe something, a little comfortable exercise or two that just so that you can play around with stuff. And uh, when we come back next week, 
you'll have a chance maybe to have downloaded two weeks here. Yeah, two weeks from now. Well, yeah, I'll be here on Labor Day. <laughs> if you want to come, I won't be here. So, so uh, uh, when we come back, you'll have a chance to catch up with, you know, maybe downloading SPSS and maybe playing with it a little bit. But I will actually demonstrate for you here. It's on these computers. We'll actually get a hands-on, a, a bit of a hands-on with it. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna use frequency tables for nominal data, right? Just counts, simple counts. Hair color. How many people had those hundred brunettes? Uh, Twenty-three. How many are blondes? Eleven. So on and so forth. Okay. How do you display that graphically? Well, you could use a bar chart, for instance. Or you could use a pie chart. Now, this is a pie chart. This is what uh, this is what we call a pie chart gone wrong. Right? What's wrong with that pie chart? This was actually published somewhere. Yes. It sure looks like 50%, right? Yeah, exactly. They got the wrong, the wrong dimensions. But a pie chart might be a typical play, way that you might display uh, nominal data, right? A more common way to display it is uh, as a frequency table, right? Or as a, uh, a bar chart, right? Bar chart here, treatment and control, same number of people in each group, um, the, the, the amount, uh, how severely ill they were, mild, moderate, severe. Those are categories. Right? They're not numbers, they're categories. And the, the, the y-axis here is the frequency. How many people fall, fall into that category? Pretty simple stuff, right? Okay. So with this, uh, this is a stacked bar chart. There's a lot of different bar charts that you might run into. Okay. Now, when we deal with data that involves numerical data, right? Well, in that case, we're collecting a list of numbers. Blood pressure, we're going to take 100 people, write down the blood pressure for each one of those people. If we want to display how that is distributed graphically, we can't use a bar chart because if we use a bar chart, there'll be like, a, you know, a, a one person that has whose blood pressure is 92.1, another person is 92.2, and two people who are 92.3, right, and so on. It wouldn't make much sense to display the actual values. So what we do is we summarize those values into groups. So for instance, in blood pressure, we might summarize the number of people that have a certain blood pressure within a range of numbers, like 80 to 85, 86 to 90, 91 to 95, and so on and so forth. And then we create a, a, a form of a bar chart, but we don't call it a bar chart, from that data, right? And we call that a histogram instead. Now notice with the histogram, unlike the bar chart, the bar chart, there were gaps between those bars, right? With a histogram, there are no gaps between those, those, those bars, except for in these, over here, it means that there's missing data. There's no people that were in those groups. But if you look at all the other groups, it's continuous. There's no gaps between them. That's because each number, for instance, the number uh, uh, 41 goes into this bar, the number 39 goes into this bar, oh, yes, and so on and so forth. So there's always going to be a continuous uh, display of bars here. That's a histogram, right? So this gives us an idea of what the distribution of data is. The bar chart helped us figure out relative counts and see that a little bit more, uh, see that a little bit more intuitively. Uh, the histogram uh, uh, lets us look at uh, numerical data and see how it's uh, distributed. We're going to get used to that shape by the end of the semester, right? I mean, you guys know what that is, right? It's a normal, basically a normal distribution. We're going to hate normal distributions by the end of the semester. Right? Okay. So what does this mean? That means that a certain percentage of the people in this group, they had a mild form of the condition. Some of them had a moderate form of the condition. Some of them had severe form. Of the but this, this spread gives us an idea of where those numbers are. Okay, and you may notice that if you take enough data and break it up into a, 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 enough, na if you make the ranges narrow enough, it gets to be a smooth, nice histogram that, that mimics basically this kind of bell-shaped curve that we're going to uh, wind up doing a lot of work with as we move on. Another way that we like to display data is something called a box plot. And a box plot, in here you see it displayed sideways. A lot of times you see it displayed vertically. And the way that this works is, is that you have a line that goes all the way through here and, the, and those two thin lines at either end are called feathers. And those feathers represent the lowest number 
and the highest number. Okay, your range. They represent your range. Okay, that little circle there, that represents a value that's so far away from all the other values that, you know, we decided that maybe we're not going to include that in our distribution. There's something wrong with that data. That's called an outlier, right? You got to use, it, there are various rules that you can use or ways that you can make judgments about what's an outlier and what isn't. But if we had a box plot, that's the way we would display an outlier. So this is going to be the lowest or the zero percentile. This is going to be the hundredth percentile. 100% of the people are below this number. 0% of the people are below this number, right? So this dark bar in the middle, anybody want to hazard a guess what that is? That's close. It's not the average. It's the median. 50% of the people are below that. 50% of the people are above that. How about this box in here? What do you think this line represents here, that first line? That's going to represent the 25th percentile. Right. Notice how like this, this, the, the slope increases here. And what you're seeing there is, is that the 25th percentile is wider than the, the, the that's called the first quartile is wider than the second quartile is, right? Because there's that more people stacked up in there, right? And then you got the median, so 50% or above. And then you got the, from here to there is the third quartile. So from this point down is the 75th percentile. And from this point down is the, hundredth percentile. So these, this group of people, this area under this curve represent the top 25%. I don't know what this is. Could be something good. Oh, severity. That's bad to be in that part, right? Sometimes good to be in that part. Sometimes bad to be in that part. So, so that's the way a box plot works. Box plot is very useful because you get an idea of where the, uh, where, how the data is spread out, where the middle of the data is. A lot of times median is a good measure rather than an average, especially when you have outliers and stuff like that. Because let me give you an example. Okay. You guys go out. Anybody in here over six and a half feet tall? No. Right. Okay. That's too bad. Okay. You guys go out into the world and I, you know, I get in contact with you a year later and I ask you, what's your average? What, what salary do you have? are you making? Right. Accumulate all the salaries that you're getting and so on and so forth. Uh, and you guys, uh, the average salary is seventy thousand dollars a year or something like that. And then uh, I look at the median. Uh, excuse me. The, the median salary is seventy thousand dollars a year. And I look at the average and the average is one point two million. Right. Well, there was somebody in the class that was seven feet tall is playing in the NBA now. Right. So what happens to the average? The average is very sensitive to outliers. Right. The median is not. Right? So a lot of ways, the median is a, a more stable number than the average is. But we use the average quite a bit anyway. Okay. Okay. Is not as sensitive to outliers or extreme values. Because let's say that I, I, take, a, a hundred, I take 100 readings and the average is 80. Right? Well, if I have one person... That has a value. Uh, let's say, let's say I got one of them wrong. Person that was forty turns a person that, that had a value of seventy. Right, the average is eighty. Person that has a value of seventy uh, turns out to be two hundred. Right. When you work that into the average, the average moves quite a bit. The median only moves one person, but the average get, takes a big difference. A big, takes a big jump. In fact, if if that let's take a look at the median. The uh, Take a look at that again. If the average is 80 and that person at 79, I correct it, and they were really 30, the median doesn't change at all because it's on the same side. But the average does change. So the, the median, in a lot of ways, is a lot more stable than the average is. How are we doing on time now? 256? Okay, we're doing okay, I think. Okay, this is a way to, to plot exact values. Exact, each tick mark here actually represents an individual person. A lot of charts you'll see kind of mashups of all the, you know, like histograms and, and so on and so forth. And bo you see a histogram and a box plot here down at the bottom and so on. Okay, so let me see if I can. What I'd like to do is just to give you a look and how some of this stuff is going to work. We're going to really get into this quite a bit more next week. I have a lot of it in, in uh, uh, session one that you can play around with until next week. But for this one, this, in uh, the weekly session, right? Yes. You have um, lab materials. Yep. I, I'm opening it up right now behind me. Oh. Right? So I was just going to open this up just to show you 
that, for instance, uh, uh, we're not going to get to a lot of this today. I, you know, I, I load this stuff in here. That's an, I, I gave you a lot of material here, but I didn't really anticipate getting to uh, that much of it today. But just so you can see what this stuff looks like. Uh, when we're working with Excel, uh, let me see what's a good thing for me to open. Actually, let me try this first. How many of you guys uh, uh, would say that you're not that comfortable with Excel? Don't use it that much. A few, right? Most of you guys have used it a bit, so you're pretty familiar with it. For you guys that haven't used it that much, it really is pretty simple to work with. Okay, basically all it is is a bunch of cells that you identify by column and row number, like this box right here is B5, cell B5, right? Um, uh, and you can put one of three things in there. You can either put a word, a label, right, like January, right? Or you can put a number, or you can put a calculation. And that calculation, the way you put a calculation in there is you just drop it in equal sign first. As soon as I dropped in that equal sign, it's kind of hard to see here, but it's small. If you look up in that area, as soon as I had equal sign, comes up with a little thing there that says f of x or function of x. That means that it's ready to accept a formula. And that formula can be something you can type in. Whoops. 12 plus 10, 22. It can be something that's based on a uh, numerical calculation equals uh, 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 20 times uh, 43. Right? It can be based on something that's in another cell. For instance, I could say it's equal to what's in this cell times 45 and get a number that gives me a result. One of the nice things about Excel is I can go back and I can make corrections in Excel and make changes to my calculations uh, if I find an error, and then it will update all the calculations that were based on that. So, for instance, if I change this 234 to 100, it's going to redo that calculation. Right, and you get it'll give you that answer instead. So you can put a count. Now we also have in here we have um, uh, uh, mechanisms where we can actually do a string of calculations here. Like here we have a, sa a sales function. This is how many of an item were purchased: ten, forty, so on and so forth. This is the unit cost: eleven dollars and twenty cents, twenty dollars, fourteen dollars, and the subtotal is going to be equal to what's in this cell times what's in this cell. Okay, so the total is going to be $112, right? I, I, we can change the format here. I'm not going to go into that now. Now, rather than repeat this calculation for each one of these, I can actually click into the cell, drag down, and SP, I can tell Excel to go, go into Edit. I can say Fill Down, and instead of copying that number, it will copy that formula down uh, and adjust it for each cell and row that it's in. So it does it correctly. Okay. So there's another way you can do that too. There's once you get a little trickier, you can do that by just grabbing the corner and dragging it down. Also, it does the same thing for those of you. So we're going into you know as we move on, I, I, I'm sure I can find a couple of tricks for you guys that like think you know Excel really well that you don't know about. So uh, hopefully we'll all learn a little bit more about Excel. So now the other thing that Excel can do is is that it can. Let me open up a different. Uh, it has a number of functions buried in it. Okay, let's see. For instance, let me open this one up. Here is a series of numbers here, right? There are 10 numbers here, right? I can actually use Excel to find the average or the mean in this case. The way I can do this, I can put in an equal sign, and I can either go up here to this f of x function and click on it, and it'll come up with a list of all the possible functions for Excel that you can have in here. Some of them are statistical, some of them are mathematical, some of them are, are uh, trigonometric, some of them are investment, some of them are real, real estate, you name it, but it also includes a lot of statistical functions. And if I, I can actually search for a function, for instance, in this case, I want to know what the mean is. It doesn't actually have mean in it, it calls it average. So it's a function called average. So I can click on this, and it will let me do the average for the numbers within this range. And the way we tell it what a range is, we tell that it's from uh, uh, cell A1 down to cell A10. And we tell it's a range by using a colon. 
uh, average parent equal sign average parentheses a1 colon a10 close parentheses you know find the average for me well what about median and, well there's a function median except this time instead of going to that function I know it's there I type in median parentheses gives me a little bit of backup there reminder of how to use it and I tell it well it's from a1 to a10 I could type that in or since it's waiting for me to type that in I can actually just go to where the numbers are click down and drag without lifting and it'll fill those numbers in for me and tell me what the median is right and the mode the minimum range and so on and so forth. I can do that also there are many statistical functions built into SPSS let me see if I can find the uh, 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 I'd have to scroll down to hear the here we go. These are all statistical functions, statistical functions. And there's many of them already built in there. A lot of the tests that we're going to be working with are built in. So we can use SPSS to do certain statistical calculations. The other thing that it's useful for is, is that it's always good to display graphs, uh, uh, data graphically because it's a lot easier to understand the graph than to understand a, a, a table with a lot of numbers in it or something like that. I'm going to end with an, an interesting video. Okay. And um, 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 okay, let me find one of those. I think I got some. Okay. And here we go. So here is mold spore counts in a number of different areas. They're organized so that the location is in one column and the results of the mold spore counts are in a different column. So I actually, the way SPSS will work is I actually can highlight the labels and the numbers that were actually counted. And at the top, it, there's, there's two labels, not numbers, two labels. SPSS in this format recognizes that's something that we might want to graph. Okay, so if I go over to charts and I go into column charts, uh, I'm just going to say custom columns. It actually creates that chart for me almost instantly. Right? So that's a lot easier to interpret than those numbers are. If you look like in this case, we're concerned about whether the indoor numbers were higher than the outdoor numbers, which is yes, molds growing indoors. In fact, in both places indoors, they're much lower than the outdoor levels. So that doesn't suggest that, that mold is a problem in that area, or at least not, significant, not, not a significant problem. Okay. So you can do graph, you can create graphs and so on and so forth. SPSS does this also, but SPSS does it for larger data. When you're dealing with larger data sets, SPSS is going to be much more efficient at this than Excel is. And it's going to have many more functions than Excel has. So just to give you an idea of what Excel looks like, I'm going to open it up. It'll bounce around. Uh, IBM bought this program up about five or six years ago. And um, uh, it was developed. This program's been around for decades. And, and it's one of those programs. It's up to ver this version. is version 24. It's been around for so long that that it's got a lot of like uh, relics in it, like little bugs and little weird ways of doing things and stuff like that from the way it was originally written. So, but it would be so expensive to rewrite it from scratch. It's one of those programs that gets patched and fixed all the time, right? Rather than uh, 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 really just rewritten from the ground up. So it's gonna do a lot of, like on my Mac, there's certain properties, things I can do like blow windows up and so on, you know, by doing this on my trackpad and so on. This does none of that because nobody's written it, you know, the code into it that allow it to do interesting stuff. Same with the Windows version. There's a lot of a lot of little inconveniences and stuff. So this is one of those opening pages, like a template when you open Word. You can tell this. Don't show this dialog in the future if you want. It's kind of a uh, it's a, a way for you to navigate around, create a new data set, look up data sets that you've been working with. You really don't need this. You can just make that go away, and you can work with the file menu. Instead, file, new data, file, open. You'll notice there's a lot of different options there, new data, and a lot of different options for open data, right? But uh, but basically, what does this look like? Look like something familiar? Looks like Excel, doesn't it, right? It's nothing like Excel. Remember in Excel, uh, when we typed in here, we could put in a label. 
We can put in a number. We can put in a calculation and stuff like that. That's not what this is. This is just a way to organize data. So it's a database, right? So in the columns, each column represents a variable. The first column might represent the subject number. Second column might represent the gender. Third column might represent marital status. Fourth column might re represent weight. Fifth column might represent BMI or something like that. Each, each row represents a subject or a, data, or a data point, right? Subject two, subject eight, subject nine, and so on and so forth, right? So now I'm going to open an actual data set here if I can. Uh, here's a practice file I think I can use. Whoops, I didn't do the right thing there. I still have it there. Yeah, there it is. Let me drop it to the desktop. Oh, you know, I didn't change it to a plain desktop. I should have. I, I have, like, a, my desktop in the background. Like, I think it's Venice that it's on right now. It actually changes. It gets darker and lighter, and the little, little gondolas go by every once in a while. Unfortunately, when you're doing a video, right, anything that changes means that you have much more data that you have to store. So it makes the file size 10 times bigger. Usually I blank that out if I remember and turn it into, uh, you know, just a solid blue desktop and stuff like that. Uh, but I'm so discombobulated by being chased out of the, the room by that nasty woman. The yellow. <laughs> Came in and waved that paper at and yelled at me. She was scary, wasn't she? <laughs> don't tell her I called her nasty. Please don't tell her I called her nasty. She's not a nasty woman. She had, she was right. She had to, they screwed up and they, they she, this was her room for that hour. So she was she was hundred percent in the right. <laughs> but she did scare me, let me tell you. <laughs> let me go back to SPSS here. So you can usually I'm most I'm it's not working right now for me, but uh, most of the time you can just double click on the file and it will open in SPSS or it'll recognize that's SPSS file. Or you can go to file, open data. And you can open that stored data file. Now, notice if I were doing this online, I'd have to be worried. I know that that's my computer that I'm working with, and I know that's my user area, and I know that's my desktop. If you're working with it with a virtual desktop online, you got to worry about, oh, is that on my computer or is that on the server, you know, this desktop that I'm looking at? So it's a little bit hinky to, to work with that. If you feel comfortable with computers and and you know you can work that stuff out. It's not so bad. But save frequently because, trust me, uh, it'll surprise you every once in a while. So you have some data. Uh, 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 the data variable, whoops, let me get that out of the way. The data variable is called V1, whatever that is. I, I'm actually, so you can notice here that there are 17 subjects in this. In this uh, each line represents a subject. And each column represents a variable. Right now it's called V1. I'm going to rename that. Okay, one of the ways I can work with the data is, is that I can use one of two forms of this sheet, this page, this workbook in SPSS. I notice down here it says data view and variable view. Up here you see an, uh, you see it mirrored up here, data view and variable view as well. Okay, but I can click down here, either use view or down here, click on variable view. And now what you see is a view of it where I can't, uh, fortunately I can't blow this up. Um, uh, on the, on the, uh, you'll see there's only one column going straight across. This is my variable. So I'm going to change that to BP for blood pressure, let's say, right? And it's a numeric variable. The width is 12. How much space I want to allot to it is 12. I really don't need that much. I'm, it's uh, where I'm going to, I'm going to make it one decimal or no decimals or so on and so forth. I'm going to leave it one decimal, for instance. Okay. Um, the label. The label is, you know, I just clicked in there, gave, put a number in there. It's clear. It's, ignore that the fact that I did that. I want to stick to that one row there. Okay, uh, it's going to be twelve. It's up to twelve numbers wide. It can have one decimal place. Now the label is something where notice that the variable name is BP. That may not mean anything to a uh, layman. Uh, it may not be precise enough for a scientist or something like that. Uh, and also, it may be a little bit weird to have that on a graph. Sometimes you may have VP 939 or something like that, but some way they, 
We collect the data. Uh, uh, we want our graphs, our tables that we create now to be a little bit more descriptive. So I can tell it, you know, even though SPSS gave it the variable, I'm using the variable name BP, whenever you use this in a table or graph, don't call it BP, call it blood pressure. So that label will be substituted for the variable name. Why is that important? Because one of the things that I just did when I made that label, I put a space in. SPSS uh, date, uh, uh, variable names, no spaces, has to start with a letter, can only have letters and numbers, no special characters, no underscore dollar signs or anything like that. Right. So now, any time you see this, it's going to refer to as blood space, blood space pressure rather than just BP. And for this, it doesn't make that much difference. If this were a categorical variable, I could go into the values here. And most of the time with categorical variables, rather than type in male or female, for gender, you're going to say one and two, right? One represents male, two represents females. Good from a lot of different perspectives. One is, is that that's uh, uh, a, a lot easier and quicker to type it in one or two. The second is you're going to wind up with fewer errors because um, uh, 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 computers take things literally. So if you type in capital M-A-L-E and you type in lowercase M-A-L-E, it won't be the same thing for a computer. But if you use one and two, you won't get into that trap. And in this case, if it's a categorical variable, I can tell it that the value one represents male. Value one represents male, right? Number two represents female, right? And I can add that. So now when SPSS does its work, it will substitute male and female for, on a chart or a table for the one and two. I'm going to get rid of those because this is not a categorical variable. Uh, move. Move. Okay. Okay, yeah, go across. Uh, what do you want to do with missing values? SPSS normally will ignore missing values. If you want to do something special, like code them so that the value 99 represents, uh, uh, they wouldn't allow me to take their blood pressure. The uh, uh, value uh, uh, 999 means that they were uh, uh, physically incapacitated and I couldn't take their blood pressure. Right? You want to code what the missing values are, why, why they were missing. You can put that in there. But for the most part, it'll ignore missing values. And you'll probably, in most cases, not worried about it. How many columns wide the display is, whether it aligns to the right or center, and so on and so forth. What kind of measure it is. Now, this is important because this is where we tell SPSS what kind of data. Even though it says it's numeric here, it just put that there automatically because all it's always numbers on, uh, on that list on, on the uh, data side of this. Okay. So is that scalar, ordinal, or nominal? Because numbers sometimes can represent categories instead of actual numbers. Well, it's a scalar value. It's, it's, it's blood pressures or whatever they are. Uh, if we're nominal, we want to put nominal. For, for instance, gender, we would change that to nominal and put in values for what the numbers represent. But this is going to be scalar. You want to get that right because SPSS is going to attempt to use statistical tools that might only be appropriate with numerical scalar variables. Right? We don't want it uh, to use the wrong kind of tool. It may keep you from using the right tool if you identify it wrong. Okay, so here we are. You notice that changed the blood pressure there and so on. So let's say I want to do an analysis like we just calculated the mean and the median before. Well, in SPSS, what we're going to do is we're going to go to the drop menu. There's actually, I'm going to click on uh, analyze. I'm going to go to descriptive statistics because mean and median are descriptive statistics. If I'm dealing with gender, I'm going to go into frequencies. Give me the frequencies. How many males? How many females? If I'm dealing with numerical variables, I'm going to go into descriptive statistics. And I'm going to, uh, normally you'd have a lot of variables, columns with different variables. In this case, we only have one. It's going to want to know which ones you want to work with. I'm going to move that into this box. And it's going to have some options. What do you want to know? Mean, standard deviation, variance, range, so on and so forth. I'll click all of those things. And I click OK. A separate window opens up called the output window. The output window has our calculations and our notice it says now blood pressure. Didn't use BP, used blood pressure. The number of subjects, 17, the range, minimum, maximum, the mean, the standard deviation. We'll worry about those things later on. But it created this table for me. I can click on this table, I can say copy, then I can paste that table into a Word document or a report. So if you're taking Epi next semester and you're putting together a paper, you can do your calculations in here, 
create a nice table, and perhaps even create a nice graph. Uh, one of the other options I have here, I'm going to go to Analyze, Descriptive Statistics. There's another version of it called Explore that'll do even more stuff for me. And I can also tell it to give me a histogram. Uh, I'm going to click OK. And this time, different, slightly different command. This time, it's going to give me a lot more statistics automatically, but it's also going to create that histogram for me as well. If I want to do that, it's going to create a box plot for me. So if I want to use that in my presentation, I have it available to me now. And you can actually double click on these things. It's got a, it's got a graphical editor, so you can go in there and give it a title and, and dress it up a little bit and stuff like that. So it does a lot of good stuff. And why does it do a lot of good stuff? Because it's designed specifically to do statistical analysis. Okay, now, with this stuff right here, within a couple of weeks, you're going to be, it's going to be like riding a bicycle. Once you start to play with it, it looks like I'm doing this very quickly. I know. So don't get intimidated by how fast I'm doing it. The thing is, like a bicycle, the way you learn how to ride a bicycle is not by watching me ride a bicycle. Not by watching a YouTube video. Like, well, nowadays, everybody learns everything from a YouTube video, right? So not by watching a YouTube video. You learn how to ride a bicycle by getting on a bicycle. That's why I really encourage you to, to you know, go at least for the $40 version. You know, uh, if you, uh, uh, so that you have it on your computer. And, you know, you're at, you know, it's a rainy day. You can't go to the beach. Open it up and, start, and play with it. Right? We know software programs. You can't break them. Right? You, you, you do something wrong, you just shut them down, start them up again. You're back in business. Okay, so I really encourage you to, to get get it early, not leave too long. Okay. Uh, I'll give you data. You can use the data sets I have here if you want, or you can create your own data sets. You know, or if you want, I can add more data sets and stuff like that. Or you can go online and say, I know SPSS data set, right, and actually find some data sets online as well. Okay, but trust me, we're going to have plenty of data sets around here by the time we get. There done with this whole thing. So you might want to just, just to get a feel for how this works. One of the other things that kind of, that, that you might want to keep, make note of is notice that the output window and the data window, are two different windows. When you quit this, if you don't save both of these windows separately, they're gone forever, right? Uh, actually, the data set is going to, it's going to ask you, do you want me to save you and stuff like that? If you made any changes. In this case, I made changes. You want me to change. Uh, closing this data set will exit in uh, SPSS. I'll say yes. Uh, save the contents of the output viewer. It's warning me to save it if I want to save it. You could actually export that to an, a Word file. They call it an RTF file, rich text file, but it's really a Word file. Or, or you can you know, let it go, or you can copy the data, the charts, and the other stuff out to a Word document if you don't want to particularly save it. I'm going to say no. So, but that's how, that's what SPSS is. That's how SPSS works. And like I said, you can go, you can open a Word document, just paste those. I don't know if I, I don't know if I held on to it. I think I said, I think I said, uh, you saved it. Not sure. Paste. Oh. Nope. I didn't, I didn't remember to copy it. If I had copied one of those, that one of those uh, uh, graphs or tables or something like that, it would have pasted into this document right now. I don't know what that is that I just pasted. Oh, that was some of the data, frankly, from Excel. Maybe I pasted it. Okay, so that's basically what you're looking at, a quick view of what you're looking at with SPSS. Okay, so now I just want to play a real quick video for you, and then we're all going to run away. I actually, tell you the truth, we, went, we almost went to the bitter end anyway. Um, the question of saving your work. Yes. Um, is it like Word where you can choose to save it? File yes. it goes to your, another no, you can tell it save anywhere you want. Just say save as instead of say save instead of save, and you can put it any folder you want. In fact, when you're working, if you work with the the uh, virtual desktop version of it, you want to be careful about where you you want to always say save as and make sure you're saving your final version of your stuff, your desktop or your computer somewhere, so you can get to it, not just save it on the virtual desktop, right? Because then. Most of the way these computers are set up for security reasons is that at midnight, they, they erase everything. Everything you see on the desktop is computers. So the same thing with the virtual desktop. Right. By the program after the six months, your files disappear? No, your files stay. Oh, 
Oh. Your, your files are no problem. Okay, now I want to just show you one quick little video. If I can find it. Hopefully I can get this to play. Uh, oh, no. Actually, I'm going to try and do it. I'm going to quit this. I'm going to log out of this, have Hans Rosling. 